Table Talk is not your typical D&D TTRPG podcast. We are not here to run you through our whole campaign. We're here to talk about everything else in the space of Table Talk. I'm your host, Alejandra Wilhelm. And I'm also your host, Mariah Gresham. And we're your tabletop roleplay girlies. Alrighty, and we are live back with your favorite tabletop roleplay girlies. Um, and welcome back from whatever you were doing. Probably listening to our previous episode, hopefully. Um, but we're here and we're going to talk a little bit about compelling villains by popular vote because we could not decide between our two possible episode ideas. So we'll just have to wait on, you know, metagaming, how to meta, how to prevent metagaming um, for another time. But for now, we're talking about villains specifically how to make them compelling and interesting um and veer away from maybe possibly like the the problematic the stereotypes <laughs> yeah possibly um as like our lovely lovely friends at slovenly trolls do such a great job at um but yeah so compelling villains i think personally 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 um we always talk about Strixhaven. I'm going to continue to talk about Strixhaven. Um, Listen, it's it's a great fountain of <laughs> content, and that we're and it's also we're about to play it this week. Yeah, I'm so excited. So, well, not by the time you guys listen to this, no. but we're recording it when there's like less than seven sleeps before Strixhaven. Again. Yeah, <laughs> counting the sleeps, I can't. <laughs> um but uh speaking from my own perspective uh, as a dm um i really really strived with like the world that we put strixhaven in because strixhaven i mean you know we we say strixhaven campaign it's a strixhaven campaign by the skin of its teeth it's i i looked at the book saw the the basics of how to run that university and then tossed it over my shoulder um and did my own thing yeah. with it so like i basically have rebranded you know a lot of the professors i maybe use their names but then i also like did a whole new revamps on their art and you know yep. different i created new professors and new students yeah etc it's it's a rich rich world and tapestry that we're doing and placed it in one of my own homebrew like cities that i had already kind of established a system and then they're like you know as world building does had to create a whole world and yada 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 but with strixhaven i really strived for a, a couple of things um you know as like a mixed bag of queer women and like a like slightly diverse group ourselves. Um, we, I wanted it to be a world obviously with, you know, I don't want sex. I don't want the isms to be a thing um, necessarily. Right. I don't think I have to rely on them as a crutch to make compelling villains personally. No. Um for me, and especially like the, for me, the thing that I like to play around in, this is kind of my favorite world with villains, is, you know, villains have motivations of their own. And I like villains who you can almost understand why they do the things that they do. Yes. And that's my favorite world yes, to I. play in. I like mm -hmm. villains that are villains by the circumstance of the side that you've chosen and you could have easily ended yeah. up on the other side of that i love the same a plane in shades of gray yeah and it's like there there are things that characters will do and choices that they will make that will maybe make them irredeemable mm -hmm. after a certain point but no one is like a quote unquote, you know, good guy or gal or non-binary pal. Yeah. And everyone has the capacity to do monstrous things. Exactly. Like, again, to continue with the Strixhaven example, like after the Lisette fight, and it came out that, you know, Lisette was the one that had been 
trying to create all these reborns and it killed like we don't even i don't know that we even got a full like death toll on the amount of people we'll probably get that next session but um that it killed Anya that it, and resurrected her, that it killed her parents and tortured them for months beforehand. And I had Anya cut out her tongue and cut off her hands so that she could not cast anymore. And, like, I justified that in saying, like, well, my, like, you know, freshman in college character probably didn't go right to that. But, like, her god was fairly present in the fight as far as just, like, because she was... It plays into his sort of people fucking with life and death and trying to, especially Lisette, trying to uh, reclaim the soul of his previous champion and then Anya becoming his new champion. Um, And we've canonically made McCall a god that is quite vengeful and wrathful. But then also has the capacity for like kindness and like he's a like complicated person that is a lot has gone into him being where he is. Mm-hmm. But in certain aspects and like punishing those who try to force people into undeath or forcibly disregard or disrespect the cycle of life and death and his role within that, he's vengeful. Yeah. And so his solution was. She needs to not cast. So that's how I worked it in my head. Because I, I, Mariah, had the idea. And then I was like, I don't know, the Anya wouldn't think this right away, even though I did. Because I'm, I, I love dark stories. And I love when characters do fucked up shit. And then they have to live with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is an objectively monstrous thing to do. Yeah. And Anya as a character is now going to have to deal with the fact that she did that and what that says about her and is what she's already done, what she may or may not end up doing in the process of like Lissette's interrogation and execution coming up. Like at what point when you're hunting the monster, do you become one yourself? Absolutely. That's a line that I like playing. Yeah. And like my big thing with Lissette when I first conceptualized that she was going to be the baddie of your, of your story. Um, I Mm -hmm. wanted someone who by, you know, by all appearances is really trusted, well respected in the community, wouldn't be like initially suspected by any, by any means. And like, you know, she's recognized for her healing. Like she was the, Mm -hmm. the uh, antithesis of everything that was going on with with you and your story at least at first glance yes um but i thought about her and i thought about the element of like you know we're we're book top girlies we're we're out here in that in that way um and and as we do and especially in like romantic stories we love a character that is a burn the earth or like burn the world salt the earth kind of guy right or yeah kind of character sure. that you know would do anything for the person that they love what does that look mm-hmm. like on the other end you know like yeah when when you're the victim of that when you are getting burned at the stake for this person's goal yeah um because Lisette is doing what we've all praised you know many 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 male morally gray villains uh for doing for doing right and like maybe not praised even but like let slide or justified or whatever yeah and so that was really interesting because that's another thing too of like you can't fully have this conversation as we we brought this up with the slovenly trolls as well without like it's not all about gender but gender absolutely has a role Mm -hmm. and how we conceptualize female villains that aren't like their rage or their cause or they're fighting for isn't resolving around a man um or solely around like trying to impress a man or get revenge for someone who took so like stole their something from them like you know the classic fairy tale stories yeah. but with Lisette, it was like like yes yeah, she was trying to uh, bring her lover back but 
it was just as much about her own uterus and her own belief that she was capable. Like, of, I am the most powerful healer, and even I cannot bring, like, my lover back. Yeah, but she thought she could. She thought, like, I can go against death and I can win. Yeah. Um, and you you can but (laughs) (laughs) at least not not in this canon not with this death god that we've made (laughs) but um like there's even things we've talked about like with um with mccall's backstory of like him becoming the god of death because uh he defeated the previous god of death because they took his lover Mm -hmm. from him and he was trying to reclaim some part of their soul um and like some of that we need to like finalize out and flush out Mm -hmm. but and that is partly why because like mccall is you know ancient at this point but it's partly why he's so vigilant and vicious in the enforcing of those rules because he's been on all sides of it and he knows the costs and the collateral that comes with trying so desperately to go against to the natural laws. something yeah that you will fail and then you will have consequences you know what what we had here where you have just you know truckloads of dead people that yeah. you've killed for nothing yeah um, just wasted lives uh which that'll be an interesting thing too if you know like who all those other people were mm-hmm. and like how has Lisette been able to do this mm-hmm. without like, where are all these people coming from? I don't know. <laughs> Which is why, like, yeah, I need to, we need to touch base again before <laughs> before the session with those, like, because that interrogation is going to be this this, ep- this this episode. This episode. <laughs> this session. This session. Yeah. Um, but they feel like episodes. They really do. How I feel like marathons, them. God. Um, Truly. But, yeah, Le, like, Lisette has a special place because she is my she's my first she's my first baddie she's my first villain um Mm -hmm. that i got i got to go into like really figuring out like her motivations what has she been doing um and all of that and like i really really had fun finding those things out and what motivates her and what defines her really and i didn't want um i let i love the idea and it's it's probably because of like me as a person. It's I we we both have that mentioned that theme of like, what are you willing to do for love, right? And love mm-hmm. is is a pure feeling. It's something that most people associate with good, um, but love can also be an incredible motivator for some not so great actions. Um, her obsession, yeah, or, obsession, yeah, lust, desperate, all those things, half-brained actions, yeah, yeah, and um, you know, like uh, I'm a big lover gal, and I love hard, and like I think I've 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 I put a lot of that element of like, what would I be willing to do for the people that I care about when I truly truly love them, and I'm like damn near yeah. anything, and yeah, like I wanted to really like sink myself into that into that feeling of like what lengths would you go to in a world of magical potential if the person you love mm-hmm. most in in this fucking universe was gone and you couldn't bring them back yeah and funny enough like i i had a similar approach with anya because like so much of how she sees herself in her life and you know the things that anchor her or her parents, mm-hmm. because she's probably about the only she's one of the few characters that I've maybe ever played, certainly in our campaign, that um, had a a good childhood, but like and had a very, had very healthy relationships with her parents, and she was well loved, and her parents were present, and like they were very, she was their everything, and they were her everything, and so losing both of them, and then losing so much of herself in that death. And, like, what that death and resurrection did to her mentally and emotionally and how she viewed herself. Mm -hmm. And we've played around with that a little bit. And I think it will continue to build. Like, now that she's sort of, she feels like she woke up, she didn't know where her parents were. And her whole, you know, 
Terminator mission was to reclaim her memories and figure out what happened to her parents and try to save them or if she couldn't save them, avenge them. Yeah. And so part of that will be done with Lisette, but then there's us. part of it will not be done. And so there's also this thing of she's like, I've turned myself into a weapon and I am more than willing to set myself on fire mm-hmm. at, for for this vengeance and for this revenge. And she's like, I am a I am a tool to wield in this and it ha- will have a hard time seeing herself as anything else because that's all she's seen herself as yeah since she was resurrected and that is going to be really interesting going into you know like you just fucking go back to like oh you're a sophomore in college mm-hmm. now like go back to your normal life as the school tries to sweep this under the rug <laughs> right yeah and like Okay, like, get out, like, yeah, just go to class. You mm-hmm. definitely interrogated and helped kill one of the deans a few weeks ago. That's fine. We're just not going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, super hush-hush. And, and needs to know. And then there's, like, things where she's involved herself with, like, Oak and his network now. Like, in this very desperate grabbing at any potential straws that she could for help and for aid. And the fact that it's the bigger organization that was involved in this has still not been caught. And so she's put herself into a lot of different webs and she handles herself very carelessly. And she's maybe a little bit better about that now that she is Masal- Mal- like, nope, <laughs> McCall's champion. Um, really, I messed myself up because they're so like Mithras, McCall, like there's another one that's very similar. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's just Mayris. I was like, there's two. I have a theme and I've struck to it too, too closely. Um she is in some ways still a a weapon for McCall, mm-hmm. but I don't think she knows who she is really outside of that. Yeah. That vengeance. And that's going to be a really interesting thing to then be put into like a fucking ball with the high society, you know, people of Trodane for her ex's engagement. Yeah. It's just, it's going to be a fucking mess. And I'm so excited for it. <laughs> yeah. But in a, yeah, in a way of like she's inherited that rage, yeah, from Lisette. Like that was ironically, Lisette gifted that to her <laughs> when she resurrected her. Yeah, and it's uh, for me in that world. I think like I I love that gray area. I love understanding a villain's motivations, knowing that could have very well been you should should you have mm-hmm. been like put in similar similar shoes right um and in a way yeah. like you know other people might view you uh as a villain later on um as like that's For that's sure. life baby like you can't please everybody and sometimes yeah. you are the villain in other people's stories and other and you're the hero in your own and it's really a matter of perspective and yeah it's that thing of like history is written by the victors exactly and so i like to play a lot in that and like a lot of the other villains that i've got cooking um fall in that similar vein right they're they're placed in a variety of different lifestyles and social classes etc they have different motivations um and but like you know i never want in my specific worlds to have elements like race or uh, their gender or gender expression, um, you know, beef or, or, or sexuality, what have you, all of those things that none of that is necessary for me, um, no. to, to find, like, you know, define them in that way. And I also like, don't like, you know, I deal with enough sexism in my real fucking real life. I'm not, exactly. uh, we ain't going to do that shit. Unless it's really just a, like, like some fucking low life dude in a back alley that I just want y'all to like punch clean through the fucking mouth and have a little power trip mm-hmm. or, or whatever. But it's going to be very clear of like, I don't know, this dude said something and you're free to just fucking wallop him if you want to. Um, right. Like you can kill that man. It's fine. Yeah. This is, um, this is therapeutic. Th- there's some things like... <laughs> Literally, this is this is your venting session. Just enjoy your rage room in this alley. Yeah, but like, there's some things like the um we've talked about, like Dragon Age TTRPG, where it's like, well, if you play um an elf in that, like, Hella you're gonna get elf racism, right? Because there is canonically 
rate like racism against elves. And so I think things like that are kind of an exception to the rule. But in rule like in games that I'm homebrewing or that I'm running or making up that don't have a very set world and structure like something like Dragon Age would, I also don't don't pick up, you know, the things of the any of the isms. I think it's a bit lazy yeah. writing and it's not necessary. Like uh, there's a a bit that I like a lot in the beginning of like the vampire, the masquerade book, and it's probably to some extent in all of the White Wolf books. But it just talks about how like this is a very dark game. And, you know, to make sure that you make that clear to everyone before they they embark on this. And like it's not a story of heroes, it's a story of monsters of varying degrees with various, various motivations. And that like life is horrific enough. And we don't need to bring the everyday horrors of life into this Mm -hmm. necessarily. And so that's not what, that's not what we do. And it's like, there are certain things where it's like, I know, I know each of you, obviously you're three of you are my best friends. Like we've had conversations and I know the lines between like ways to make things impactful, but then all, but not make them triggering. Yeah. Um, and so think of like, we in that OSRP thing, I think I had, um, like when Riley had Revna, you know, chained up in that cellar, um, she had like iron shackles and an iron collar on. And I did that because I thought it was important to show the power dynamic that Riley saw existing. And also the fact that like we had already determined that she had kind of been paraded around mm-hmm. even as like an, an oddity around the colony even before she was embraced so it would be a thing of like her being treated like an animal yeah but it's not something where we're gonna like have a s- slave auction right no. like that's not <laughs> we're, something we're, we're not, not gonna, gonna do no. <laughs> we're not gonna do that um we're not gonna have like human trafficking like even with and this is the thing where it's like you know where does all where do all these kindred get get mortals to to drink from um yeah and there's a lot of weird things around consent there but that's not something i really feel the need to have yeah in the game of it's like i can there are plenty of atrocities (laughs) i can commit that aren't that and that can still be equally impactful. Yeah, I think the power of like leaving certain things unsaid, letting you letting your imagination wander and and wander and wonder about what that means, how that happens, or whatever can it equally be as impactful. Like I think a lot, and like for example, you know, in a lot of horror. Mo- I find the horror movies that are the most terrifying are the ones where I don't ever see the thing that is yeah like coming after them because then your imagination goes fucking bonkers wild Mm -hmm. um and like you know you don't necessarily need to paint those pictures to to make somebody a horrific person um you can see the aftermath of their horrific actions and things like that and the the effects of of what their their you know rule or action or or whatever they're doing has on the people around them yeah Yeah. to understand the severity of of that villain and their level of power and their level of influence etc and if it is something where it's like you you do feel like or if canonically someone has done something like something that is quite atrocious you can like you said approach that from the perspective of like someone who's escaped or like someone who's helping take them down or something like you can do something to try to like give some agency back Mm -hmm. like i and the same reason that um i'm not gonna like have monologues around certain things with like mental health or severe depression i'm also not gonna monologue you know really graphic certain really types of violence yeah very graphically like gore fine um certain things fine but like and that's all that's all in our consent and we we definitely went through that and there are probably things that i'll i'll check in again as we continue with the vampire campaign Mm -hmm. but certain shit like we're just not yeah like i'm not comfortable 
dictating it and painting that word picture. No. And I don't want to make anyone sit through it either. No. But you can 100% like dig into dig into that character, dig into their their motivations dictate. And like there's so much room to play there. There's so many so much horrific traumatizing shit you can pull off. Uh that yeah, if you're having to rely on like those elements, like you said it before, it's a, it's a little bit lazy. I ain't gonna lie, because um, there's there's so much yeah. more to use, and it makes them so much more impactful that way. It, once your your players realize like what's driving this person, certainly there's people that are just like you know evil for evil's sake, and that's also kind of horrific to be like. Oh, there's no way to talk this person down from fucking crazy. Um, yeah, that's also like plenty of plenty of shit you can play around with there. Um, sure, I think one. But even that is less interesting to me. Yeah, of it's like if someone gets to the point where they're evil for evil's sake and they're just a megalomaniac, like I, I want to see that descent. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of follow, see them go down that path. Yeah, toward just completely off the deep end i don't want it to start yet. yeah probably the be- the best way for that would be like to start with you know some character that's like in the background or like a beloved side side friend and pc whatever and then they just slowly start falling into that and having someone that like was once really really like beloved by the players having mm-hmm. fallen into that and knowing that there's no redemption there for them there's no way to get that person back uh after after they they've become irredeemable uh by their actions and have to be taken care of accordingly well it's like that's potentially what was going to happen with neris at the very end of the ravenloft campaign because effectively like straw she was a reborn but like straw had reset apparently it's like killed and resurrected her and so like traditionally we use the full traditional reborn lore there so when they're killed and resurrected they lose all of their memories mm-hmm. um so it's basically like whenever nara scott you know she'd been strad's creature for four or five hundred years but whenever she got to where she was making too many connections or she was starting to figure things out or getting too suspicious straw would just kill her and reset to reset her memory and bring her back and to keep her a pliant toy mm-hmm. basically so there was a very high chance that that would either happen again at some point in the campaign and then she has no idea who the party is or you know it was going to be that would it would push a fight with strahd because he's trying to do that and then the party catches it or something where she very likely could have been could have been turned against the party pretty pretty easily Mm -hmm. and that was really interesting for me to have on the table i was like yeah she she could there was also a path for redemption, but there was the grimdark path as well. And I liked, I liked having both. Yeah. And being able to like, see how it would have organically like developed on its own. Yeah. And I think like when I approach writing villains, whether it's for a novel or for campaigns or anything like, I almost will, similar like how you see like actors who play villains or they're like, they have to find their that character's pov like point of view or their reasons for why they do what they do or things that justify them and i really try to sit with that and be like okay why put myself in that character's shoes why are they making the choices they're making and justify it to an extent for myself from that character's point of view yeah so when i'm writing things that they're doing i'm not cringing away because i'm like yeah this is objectively fucked but for that character it feels correct Mm -hmm. and it feels like the only path forward yeah um which is can get quite dark and there's a good bit of self-care i think you have to do for yourself when you're writing uh writing villains and writing very dark stories of like because it can take you into a really dark headspace mm-hmm. um like there was the uh oh gosh what is manacle the um it's a i'm outing myself as <laughs> a draco hermione um fan fiction connoisseur but that's okay mm-hmm. uh then like have you have you read manacle i don't think so but do send me the link after we're done recording <laughs> i will say like it is one of those ones where 
100% check the trigger warnings, check the trigger warnings, check the trigger warnings. Um, the like author wrote it and you know, it's, it's fan fiction, but it's fan fiction that is so long that I did count it on my Goodreads when I wrote that I found it and I'm like, I will get credit for this <laughs> because it has been so emotionally draining. I I'm no, I will get my adult accelerated reading points for this, <laughs> but like, there's a lot of essay themes and mm. dubious consent, non-consent and things like that like it's a very dark story and points in like there's graphic twists because the thing is like it's a uh, the war ended where like Voldemort won mm. right and so it's the that takeover and that's the premise for a lot of them and they're varying level there's fan fictions on, on varying levels of of grim dark with with that premise but manacled is one where like it stuck with me of the the descriptions of the violence and the war and the injuries and like it was incredibly graphic but it also made it very powerful yeah but it also like going i almost lost my train of thought of why i brought that up but that is something where like yeah you kind of have to do some self-care and like i remember reading works people had asked the author of like oh would you write it from like draco's point of view and she's like no it would be way too fucking sad and i can't put myself in that headspace oh, no. <laughs> to do it because the world is so fucking dark yeah. and like so irrevocably fucked up that she's like i it was i was in a bad headspace writing it when i wrote it the first time to just how dark it got in spot in spots and yeah i think like that was a really for me as a writer, reading that was like an eye-opening thing where I was like, oh, that is something that I, I at that point did not think about mm -hmm. a lot. But as like a girly that loves some morally gray to just morally black, <laughs> um, very dark coded villains. Fanta um, black villains. It, it's a, a fanta, fanta black villains. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's also now a t-shirt. <laughs> but um, that that's definitely something to think about too i think from the perspective as a dm and then also for your players of obviously a lot of this gets discussed in the session zeros and the consent checklists and stuff but like what are you comfortable describing so like even after that last strixhaven session you messaged all of us asked kind of doing a check-in after that but you messaged me privately first and you're like you know, like are you okay like was it too graphic whatever and i i was like no i love that shit like i'm an i'm getting into the world of like loving horror and it was everything i wanted it to be and more and i did not feel like it was too much um but i know that was hard for you in the moment because like it was stressful and i was crying yeah. and like it there was a lot and that's hard because like we're for you don't want to make your friend no i'm cry, a i'm a certified even they can yeah you. i'm a certified people pleaser mom friend do you know how fucking hard it is yeah. to sit at that table play a villain and make your friends purposely like uncomfortable or scared or sad and you're like my brain is telling me i'm doing bad things but i know this is what we're here for <laughs> and so like that's an that is another element of it that i i didn't really think about until we started talking about it yeah it but like it was difficult to like be in the moment and like like knowing i'm describing things and seeing discomfort and not reel back from it and have mm -hmm. to like go more yeah. um because like that was very counterintuitive for like my natural instincts um as, yeah. a, as a human <laughs> so uh yeah just as a decent as a be. decent person um if it wasn't that would be a little concerning, yeah like. yeah um you know it, it's it's something um i wanted to i wanted to take the little draco um the draco plug to talk about um our new uh, not necessarily villains in the sense of like BBGs, but we are entering an arc of Strixhaven where we are dealing with um, a very powerful family that is very Malfoy coded, Lannister coded. Absolutely. Um, so they're 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 very antagonistic, um, even within their own family dynamics, and that's something I've like. That's another like you know. 
how to make compelling villains think of like ulterior things that would motivate them or why they're they're bad and i've loved diving into that like family toxicity what uh manifests in your children when exposed to it when like toxic family dynamics are happening when hardcore the generational expe- trauma, the generational trauma. Not that I would know yeah. anything about that from experience. Not the yeah, um, crazy no. whatsoever. I did not channel anything in there at all. Anyway, <laughs> no, my family's great. I love them. Um, every every yeah. family's got their issues. Our families aren't yeah. psychopaths. <laughs> Our families aren't like psychopaths, Bronx. not like to that every- degree. Everybody's family's crazy. Everybody's like, family's it's crazy. Not, it's not but I, I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate with the family that I do have. But, you know, we've got our flaws and it's it's had its effects. Same here. Um, but I definitely like it's one of those things I'm like, OK, I've taken this like small element of my life and I've cranked it up to 90. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I've broken the dial. I turned it so yeah, hard. Yeah. Like, turn that. Break it. It's fine. Um, but, yeah, I've fun. really loved diving into like each member of that family's motivations and like how they Mm -hmm. they grew up and what effects did that have on them and how is that affecting their children and how are those children now affecting y'all um because you know you have a a relationship with one of like Callista's brothers or had one um yes and you know her Callista's third oldest brother yeah Narian yeah who is a t- who has a twin is um, Thena is on his ex yeah yeah which Thena's we've not met Thena we're gonna meet Thena very we're gonna soon, meet Thena very and soon it's gonna be a, gonna be a time um because I'm pretty sure Anya and her brother will have slept together by that point so that's gonna be great <laughs> who knows? Um, let the dice decide everybody um but yeah so it's been really really fun digging into that and it's also i think it's also fun whenever you're playing with those kind of like low-key villains in the sense of like they're not necessarily like capital b capital b capital e capital g level shit um but they're meant to be like you know light antagonists in the story like lucius like um callista's like second oldest brother Mm -hmm. who is like objectively crazy but he's not like He's very, also very self-absorbed and doing his own thing, and he's like a C. Yeah, so he'll he'll li- leave and let live as long as you don't get in his way, kind of thing. He's not gonna so go seeking it out, but if you do happen to cross paths with him, uh, in the wrong way, uh, it's gonna be rough for you, my guy. Jack, our other character, has it coming for them, and I'm so excited about that. Jack really does. I'm also very excited for that <laughs> and nervous. Um, we're gonna have to all just stay in public for very different reasons, but yeah, <laughs> we're all gonna have to stay in public. Yeah, but it's been it's been really good to like. I think even before we started the session, I was like rewatching Game of Thrones with my mom, and like when anytime we had mm-hmm. the Lannisters on screen, my mind was just fucking going and i was like oh the, these are who these fuckers are um and i and i love taking those like elements of toxicity but again also like before we started we started get, we we're about to start this arc i had a, another check-in with y'all because i was like hey you know this family is capital t toxic and we're about to yeah. be in very close proximity with them for long-ish periods of time maybe we're going into the lion's day. We are going into the lion's day and continue the uh, yeah, continue the Lannister yeah metaphor yeah. And so I was I wanted to make sure to check in with y'all because I was like you know we we've, we've all got family trauma and I wanted sure. to make sure that like we understood where we were okay where we weren't okay. Obviously, I've checked with the player um, whose arc is about to be because I'm like, she's going to get the brunt of most of it um, and making sure that she's comfortable with how, how far we might take it and, and all of that stuff. But that's like, again, something that, you know, she wrote this character and she gave it to me and I'm like, yeah, you know, the, the, this is the playground and the themes that you wanted to kind of work in. So I'm going to try to try to deliver Absolutely. so that it's satisfying in the end whenever y'all come out the yeah, other side we were all like break it it's fine like yeah we're <laughs> like we know we know what we asked for i mean i know for me like 
there because there's been moments yeah where and it's so good to actually genuinely feel uncomfortable in this moments because you should right when these like you're role playing or watching people role play out these very toxic family dynamics like that shouldn't feel comfortable yeah um but like you and bex do it so well that like i always sit and table and i'm like god damn like our mom is fucking crazy <laughs> like jesus like i knew you were crazy but christ that like that we're out here like that um but then, like, going into this, which I'm very excited for Anya to just be a fucking agent of chaos with her emotionally detached self. i just be like, like, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's just emotionally dead inside. Yeah, she's so. she's really about to be on that, like, that, that find yourself journey. Because you're like, okay, I've completed my, basically, the only thing that was keeping me going. Um, yeah. What now? With. And we're going to go to my parents' funeral where Calista's mom will be there. And then we're going to go to the island that their family owns for a whole weekend of ball festivities for my ex to get engaged. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, we're on weird terms. Anya and Marian are on, like, d- it better than they were, I guess. But, like, I that contribute that very to the dice. Because that boy was Truly. supposed to be an insufferable fuck boy. And he just keeps rolling he horns is. on his goddamn... He is to, like, everyone else at that school. But Anya. <laughs> but with like, you, yeah. he's, just, yeah. he's just a simp. A simp. <laughs> There's a picture of Denarian in the dictionary next to the, the term simp. Um, and I love that. And I'm also excited to see that kind of duality of Narian's character. Because... He's going to be so disgruntled about the whole situation and that he's supposed to be, like, getting engaged to someone that he doesn't even fucking know or want to be engaged to. And, like, we're going to try to pull out some, like, 11th hour, get him out of it thing. But if, like, regardless, he's going to be, like, pissed. And I'm joking. I'm like, oh, how drunk is Mary going to be this whole like ball and you're like yes and like well that's gonna be great i'm just gonna have to fucking patch that up yeah because the bloodstone siblings which is the family i'm like can't act like they like each other in public because that's not how that family goes oh well they that's they do they do act like they like each other in public that's public that's maintaining public image it's, it's frosty but like it's frosty. They don't. It's not like they like each other. Like, oh man, your brother drank too much and is like has fallen over on the floor. Like you don't go and fucking. Oh no! Like if they see him. one of them fucking up, they're like, I'm gonna let your ass drown. Yeah, for sure. Um, so even if like Callisto maybe liked to intervene, she can't without like setting off warning bells of like, why are y'all acting like you like friendly have love and care for each other yeah. <laughs> in this household? Um, yeah, the so the yeah, only point just... really where they drag each other out of situations like that is like if they know they're gonna, it's gonna mean, hey, I'm fucking up or they're fucking up, and it's gonna get them in trouble with mom and dad. That's your that's your grave you dug it. If it's a public yeah. image on the bloodstones type of fuck up, then they then do swoop wrong. in because that gains them favor with yeah. mom and dad. For sure, yeah. If like if they can't get something out of intervening that they're not going to do yeah it, it is a selfishly motivated help up. yeah but it does make sense in that like environment with which they've grown up so it is going to be really interesting to see that public dynamic where like we're in public nary is not supposed to be simping for on loudly um, <laughs> Loud. <laughs> but then also because he truly is you've rolled more ones for him in 20s for Valentine than like you ever have in your fucking career. Truly. That's how that Truly. works. Truly. And I roll I roll ones with Valentine and really good with Narian. So like it's it all it all balances yeah. out. But um like seeing him be cruel and angry and like that fuck boy version of himself that he is to everyone else and then having to deal with Anya also being there is going to be so good yeah it'll it'll be very interesting but yeah it's been it's been an interesting playground to be in uh as far as constructing those those people as like antagonistic villains and then knowing like this the the the, Narian I think is the first bloodstone y'all really have like uh, started to uncover the stuff behind him right and his motivations and why he is the way he is and why he acts the way he is and it's tied back into you know the bloodstones overall family culture um 
which you have an insight in through him and Callista, but then all the siblings have their own reasons for being the way that they are. They have their own, sure. they took their own lessons out of the the rearing they had, um, the parents as well, which I, I'll be excited to see how yeah. much I'll figure out at the ball or not. Um, I'm really excited to see how, because like Arwen, Callista's mother and Aaron's mother was friends with, Anya's parents and in Rosenthal and like they were all in a party together when they were younger and so she's gonna rock Arwen's gonna show up at this funeral and that's gonna be a really I think thankfully for Anya that will help her like Arwen not just be like a stone cold bitch to Anya when she's at the fucking ball because I think if not for that then Anya would be like why the like Arwen would have been like why the fuck Close to why the fuck did you bring this person here? But because it's now brought, like, dredged up all of Arwen's trauma and memories and all of that with um, Anya's parents, Bryony and Baron, like, I think that will soften her a little bit toward Anya, where, like, Anya can hopefully fly under the radar <laughs> a little bit because yeah. she'll be distracted with her own emotional damage. But yeah, that's going to be interesting to kind of un- see how she reacts yeah. in that and, like, how she reacts toward Anya and and all of I think that's going to be a different side of of Arwen and then also Raina's going to be there so that'll be interesting because oh, Raina snuck into their house and fucking left a little a little post-it note on their bed frame. <laughs> uh, XOXO like XO, gossip girl. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, Raina. Raina is my my baby, my beast. That's the epitome of the like. Hey, this could be a really powerful hero on your side or she could be the end of all things and yeah I like I remember Bex asking like what because like I'm super privy to the entirety of Raina's camp yeah. because I was I, I was there when the, <laughs> you were the there when the texts were like, written entirely <laughs> yeah you were there um, when she was level and, one <laughs> truly yeah so like there there was a funny moment where Bex was like oh like if like Anya, like it or not Anya, if but uh, Calista's parents like fought fought Raina, like who would win? And both you and I immediately were like Raina. Yeah. Like without a fucking doubt. Like or, like Raina is like level 30 or higher. Like Raina She's on like, some God. some maxed out CR bullshit, man. Yeah. Raina and Oak have ascended to a higher plane. They are doing they're on a whole they're on a the whole different system. game, my guy. Yeah. Uh, which is why like yeah they can't they will never be in a fight because like it's no they snap their fingers and disintegrate people like yeah. that's not we can't be happy <laughs> no you you no they they will send you back in a box in a fucking envelope in a, like in you, an envelope. Need a box. you were just dust by the end uh yeah no uh Reina for sure is a is a work of love over years um but truly uh she uh I definitely put in that that full I mean she she is you know unabashedly my shameless self insert and uh I definitely put that like all the good and the bad traits of myself in her cranked to max so she's got she she do be that that like you know uh burn the world salt the earth type love or whatever Mm -hmm. um and then she's she's got she's got maxed out ego she's got all this charisma and all like but also she's got she's got hella demons playing that bitch um for sure and like I, I love her so much. But yeah, she... Yeah, the duality of Reyna is really, really great. And I love that Anya's just collecting scary dogs. It's <laughs> like, everyone's afraid of Reyna. And then Anya's like, damn, Auntie, I didn't know you had a shadow form. And it's just too chill about it. Yeah, it's super chill. And Reyna's like, are you... <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's a, it's She's a... not going to eat me. Yeah, I, I still love that scene forever of, like, the parent-teacher yeah. conference. And yes. that moment where it clicked for Anya why Reyna's considered scary and would technically yeah. classify as a villain. And definitely does classify as, like, a bad person to the city security. Totally. <laughs> totally. And, yeah. and most of the mortal coil, to be honest. 
Um, and so did Oak, like sitting there in his fucking yeah velvet suit or whatever he <laughs> yeah. was wearing. <laughs> these these are just two extremely power like like this woman and her mafia eldritch mafia boss husband. Truly, um, truly, you know, yeah. just walked up in here. Honestly, yeah, that's Oak. Oak is an eldritch mafia don. Yeah, that's that's the vibe. that's the best description um, I can give you. And then and then Reyna is literally just the embodiment of night in the fake court, like. You, yeah, you do not get that. The, wi- the witch in the woods they walked right from the void. Like <laughs> it's yeah, it's not chill at all, even remotely. But it's like they're they're very fun characters because like, if, I I don't think anyone has a middling reaction to them. Like it's either it's love or it's fear or it's anger or it's something like they're polarizing. Yeah. And that's really cool. And I think that is a mark of a good, well-developed character and also like well-developed villain because the people, if they have people that support them, they just support them for a reason. And if, you know, the people who hate them should hate them for good reasons. Yeah. And there are good reasons for both with with Raina and Oak. I think even like Anya's parents, like I know Anya's dad was doing some fuck shit and like making weapons of war. Yeah. It's just so like there are plenty of circumstances and like Anya's dad worked with Oak and where they were probably not good. They were not good people. Like, is Anya aware of that? No. But like, yeah, there's probably people that would look at what happened to Bryony and Baron and say they got what they deserved. Yeah, probably. Now, if they said that in front of Anya, would Anya kill them? Yes. <laughs> but again, that's the thing of like, at what point is she, you know, I mean, worse or the same as the monster that made her? There, there are people, people out there that did give them what they deserved in in their mind. Yeah, which I'm excited to have that interaction because that's going to be. I feel like Anya will make some progress and then we'll get to that point and then she will regress like a <laughs> She's like, those years of therapy, throw them out the window. Yeah, never known her. Never known that heel Those bitch. journaling props, fuck that. Fuck that. Burn them. <laughs> fuck a healed bitch. <laughs> uh, about to be toxic up in this. Um, Truly. <laughs> But I think we are we are coming to the end of things. Um, so over, I think overall in summary, um, you know, definitely get creative with your villains. Uh, you don't need to rely on crutches. I don't think there are so many yeah. more depths to the the human experience that you can really dive into that will help you find unique motivations for those villains make them compelling make them make them interesting make them someone that you might almost side with and have have your players contend with that at the table and be like damn i like i i understand their motivations and make, like even to a point unknowingly have them ally with them um or be like me and just start playing in the gray area of like what if i made like the loved ones of other players the villains and everybody else's story um and we'll we'll see what happens in that and in that in that journey make your monsters relatable it's more fun make your monsters relatable (laughs) um but thank you so much for joining us for this episode and we will see you next time bye Table Talk is a podcast brought to you by Mythos Media Productions, bringing you a new episode every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Table Talk RPG, or check us out at our website, mythosmediaproductions.godaddysites.com. All business inquiries can reach out to us via email at info at mythosmediaproductions.com.